Korea has amended its export control system on Monday, removing Japan from its white list of trusted trading partners. Once the amendment goes into effect, Japan will no longer enjoy preferential treatment on over 1,700 strategic items. Various Japanese media outlets are giving out analyses on Korea's new trade restrictions against Japan, while Japanese firms are bracing for impact. Today, we go in depth on Korea's removal of Japan from its white list amid continued. Continuing Seoul Tokyo trade frictions. For that, Dr. Yang Jun Sok, professor of the uh, economics at the Catholic University of Korea, joins me in the studio. It's always good to have you with us. Happy to be here. So, uh, Minister of Industry and Trade Song Yun Mo, while making the announcement yesterday, said that Korea needs to put an export control system in place as it's difficult to cooperate with countries that continuously violate basic principles of expert control. He also denied that removal of Japan from Korea's white list is a tit-for-tat countermeasure against Japan's removal of Korea. What do you think is the implications of Korea's decision? Okay, well, I think it basically shows that Korea has lost a lot of uh, faith in how Japan handles its export control system. Uh, now, even though uh, the uh, Korean government maintains that this is not a tit-for-tat situation, uh, I think it has been uh, confirmed that Korea uh, has lost a lot of faith in how the Japanese system was run because, well, uh, we really don't think we did anything wrong. Uh, we, uh, we have shown that uh, Korean export control system is as good or better than Japanese system. Uh, there has been very little, no or very little flows to unauthorized uh, countries, unauthorized destinations. And uh, there were virtually no difference, at least where it concerns the uh, export controls before and after uh, Japan uh, placed uh, changes on their export control system. So uh, I think Korean, uh, Koreans uh, believe that, Korean government believe that Japan is no longer at least as trustworthy as before. Uh, and that's part of the reason why uh, they changed the system. And as I mentioned before, one of the things that came out of this uh, argument between the two countries is that the Japanese export control system was perhaps not as good as Korean. Uh, there has been a lot of holes in the system, or at least that's what some people have argued. Uh, so I think this change in the system reflects that somewhat. Uh, but it does seem a lot like a tit-for-tat response. Now, Korea's amended export controls will take effect sometime next month after a period of uh, opinion gathering time. We know that Japan will no longer enjoy preferential treatment. How exactly will the import procedures change for Japan? Okay, uh, unlike J uh, the Japanese system, where previously they had 13 different types of classifications, which they uh, supposedly streamlined into four different categories, Korea only had two categories to begin with, uh, cost category and the NA category. And on the GA category, uh, it was uh, given to uh, including Japan, 29 different countries. Uh, all of those countries uh, belong to the uh, four major export control treaties agreements, and all four countries were thought to have a very good export control system. And unlike the Japanese system, all the other, uh, all the other countries were placed into the NA category. And under the CA category, uh, they had basically the same, a similar set of preferential treatment that Korea used to have with Japan under the whitelist system. So uh, uh, the, uh, those 29 countries uh, would be given a blanket uh, examination. Uh, if uh, they had no problems with their export control system, then for three years, any companies from those countries could apply for exports and they would only need to fill, uh, fill out one form. And even if they had to apply for approval, it would be given within five days. Um, note that Korean system seems to be a lot more efficient than the Japanese system. Uh, and now, uh, for the countries which were not in that category, uh, like uh, the Japanese system, they would have had to apply for each uh, exports uh, that uh, would go to those countries. Um, but there were a system of a compliance program where uh, if those non-29 uh, countries uh, wanted to uh, import some products, and if they were importing it from those uh, co uh, compliance uh, 
companies with the compliance, uh, then uh, they would be uh, given the uh, pre uh, sort of a preferential treatment, though not as preferential as those 29 countries. Now, what Korea did was it created a category in the middle, and uh, the, uh, this is called the Ka Dash One category, and under that category, uh, it, it, a country belongs to the four major uh, export control treaties agreements, but their export control system is not as solid as uh, we believe it should be. So uh, they're given a sort of an intermediate position between the CA and the NA categories. Uh, they are no longer given blanket ex uh, treatment, blanket uh, examinations. They at least have to uh, apply uh, for each individual exports to Japan, uh, but they still uh, have some preference uh, preferential uh, treatment compared to not category. For example, uh, the not category, they have to uh, submit five different forms. Uh, Japan only has to apply for three, even though the uh, car category, you only have to, uh, to uh, apply for one. And then uh, the approval will be given in five days rather than the Japanese system, which can take somewhere between 30 to 90 days if they're given at all. So uh, they've created this system uh, intermediate category, and right now Japan is the only country in it, uh, but that's basically, uh, as I mentioned before, it acknowledges the fact that Japan is a member of those four export control treaties agreements, uh, but Korea has lost faith in how they actually control their exports. Now, some point out that Korea's new export curbs on Japan will have a limited impact on Japan and instead uh, will have a greater impact on the Korean firms. Do you agree? Well, uh, I think the, uh, there is a lot of uh, argument that this is only symbolic because uh, Japan really does not import that many controlled uh, products from Korea. Uh, but on the other hand, it does point out that we have, in a sense, both lost uh, faith that the other country is keeping a good control system. So I think in that sense, uh, it was inevitable that such a uh, change would be made in the Korean system. Uh, as to the actual amount, it's going to be a lot less than uh, the Japanese exports to Korea. But uh, given the mechanism involved, the uh, system involved, I think uh, it uh, does show Korean displeasure over how Japan is controlling exports from Korea. And following Korea's announcement yesterday, Japan's Vice Foreign Minister Masahisa Sato said Seoul's removal of Tokyo from its whitelist, if it is a in retaliation of Japan's removal of Korea, violates WTO rules. Now, given that South Korea is planning to take the issue of Japan's trade curbs against it to the WTO, how would the current sentiment in Japan affect how things would play out at the WTO? Okay, I think we need to look at this from two different point of view. First, let's take the Korean government at its word, and this is a separate mechanism. It doesn't have anything directly to do with retaliation. In that case, Korea and Japan will lose together because they're basically using the same argument. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I don't think it'll really affect the uh, Korea's case in the WTO one way or the other. If Japan does file a case uh, with the uh, WTO, then we'll either win together or lost, uh, lose together. Now, let's uh, take the second case where it does turn out that Korea is using this as a retaliatory measure. In which case, yes, uh, it's uh, technically against the WTO rules, but uh, the WTO has been sort of allowing these type of retaliatory measures for a while. Uh, for example, uh, during uh, President Trump's uh, tariffs on steel, a lot of countries uh, put up a, uh, tariffs of their own in retaliation. And technically, it's against the WTO rules, but as long as it's uh, in the level of tit for tat. The uh, damages are roughly equivalent because that's what the WTO requires. Any damage from one country, you can retaliate, but only 
up to the amount that, of that damage. As long as it's not outrageously outside that realm, I think WTO usually says it's okay as long as if the case is solved and then uh, you get rid of that retaliatory measure. So uh, under both scenarios, I don't think it will affect Korea's case in the WTO all that much. Now, Japan gave its first export approval of a Korea-bound key high-tech material last Thursday, which was subject to stricter regulations since Japan first slapped its trade curbs against South Korea. How did you see that? Would you say Japan has taken a step back from its hardline stance? It's hard to see that at the, uh, at the moment. It deals with only one good. We, we know that there has been a lot of filing uh, for p uh, permission to export those controlled substances, uh, but uh, they've only given uh, permission for one. So uh, unless we see a lot more permissions coming soon, uh, I don't think we can make up our minds. And there's a bit of a suspicion here because one, uh, we don't quite know uh, which firm, which Korean firm, the uh, Japanese government gave permission to export. Uh, to export too, uh, but there's a lot of speculation that it was Samsung. And there has been a recent report in the Japanese press saying that Samsung has found an alternate source for the uh, photoresist, which is the chemical that we're talking about, and they're getting it from Belgium. So if that is the case, then if Japan maintains its export control of that photoresist, uh, then that means a Japanese firm cannot export to Samsung. So those, the Japanese firm is getting hurt, but it won't hurt the Samsung or Korean uh, economy at all. Uh, so it might have been a strategic move on their part to minimize damage on their part, uh, in Japan's part, while uh, trying to maximize damage on Korea. Uh, so we don't know until they give at least a few more permissions to export. Japan, meanwhile, did not specify items that will be categorized as items that need individual export approval. And uh, President Moon Jae-in yesterday hinted at his willingness for dialogue with Japan. Do you think Korea and Japan will be able to get together for talks anytime soon? Okay, well, because uh, this involves a case at the WTO, and if they admit that this has anything else to do, any, anything to do with something other than trade, it really weakens the WTO case. So no country is admitting this uh, verbally. But uh, the understanding is that the issue that Japan is very much interested in is the reparations to forced labor uh, that took place during the Japanese colonialization. Now, uh, Korea has signaled that it is willing to talk about the trade issue, export control issue, but Korea has also signaled that they're not interested in opening uh, any discussions on the reparation issue. And Japan has been strongly, uh, strongly giving signals that they want Korea to come up with some kind of a solution to the problem without saying it explicitly. It's widely understood that this has to do with the reparation issue. So, Unless Korea is willing to open up an issue on reparations, or if there's such a strong diplomatic pressure on Japan or internal pressure on Japan to stop uh, the, uh, this problem with export control, uh, I don't think uh, Japan is going to loosen up because, well, they haven't got what they wanted. Uh, which is Korea for, the, for Korea to open up on negotiations on the reparation issue. And as long as Korea does not open it up, I don't think uh, this situation will be solved. Well, it sounds like we still have a long way to go until the problem can be fundamentally solved. Now, Seoul's Deputy National Security Advisor Kim Hyun-jong yesterday stated that Japan's move uh, to remove South Korea from its white list has only had a handful of real effects on the Korean economy. Do you agree? Uh, I wouldn't agree completely. Uh, there's about uh, 1,100 uh, goods which are covered by the uh, Japanese export control system. Korea has identified maybe about 100, uh, which will uh, damage Korea to a uh, large enough extent that it will be noticeable. Uh, now. Uh, we don't know exactly what, uh, how much of that effect uh, will be, but just in terms of numbers, uh, it's only about 9% of the items which are covered by the uh, Japanese export control list. So that may be what he uh, meant. Um, 
And for a lot of those items, even on that 100 item list, uh, Korea can find replacements, or Korea is fairly close to developing a domestic alternative. Uh, so, but there are some very limited number of goods uh, that is crucial for Korea's production process. And that damage from that, I think, will be a lot larger than what uh, may be indicated at the moment. So uh, yes, in terms of numbers, uh, uh, Kim is uh, correct. But in terms of the effect on the economy, uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. Well, it seems like the Korean government has a lot of confidence that we can overcome this hurdle on our own, but uh, we'll have to see how things unfold. Thank you so much, Dr. Young, for your insights. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of News In Depth from all of us here at Arirang. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you right back here, same time tomorrow.